What's up, Brian Fan? What's going on, guys? Podcast episode three, as always, Coach Brendan. Coach Kristen. Coach Andrew. And we are going to talk to you guys about a lot of things, so we don't like long intros. We're just diving into it. The Prime Cast, that was what someone named it in the comment section That's a of good last name. video. That's a good oh, name. we're missing Kobe. Kobe. Uh, no Kobe today. Kobe's sitting out. He's uh, a little sick for me to do this. <laughs> Um, so guys, we're diving Same. right into it. Today we're going to talk about, as always, new research. Uh, today's concerning muscle building. Basically, is the amount of volume that you're doing to gain muscle optimal in a range or set to your individual parameters? We're going to dive into that. Mm -hmm. We're also going to talk about question of the day, which I'll give it to you now. We actually have two questions of the day. The first one is how much current volume do you train each body part with or lift with in sets per week? So when you tally up all the sets you're doing per week, how much volume are you doing either per body part or per lift? I'd be curious to hear what you guys usually average. And then I also wanna hear what your biggest mental hurdle is with lifting. So whether it be, you know, like PRs make you nervous or you overshoot a lot or you don't stick to your program, whatever it is, we want to hear. That one's going to be interesting. Yeah. Was, I can't wait to talk about wait, that. Um, yeah. That, so we're, we're going to be talking about mentality with lifting, which is hugely, I know everyone's going to roll their eyes. Oh, there's no cool science with that. Guys, there is so much to discuss there that will hugely affect your results. So we're diving into that. Let's start with the latest research today. So we have a study here that's basically showing what they did is it's, it's with a within subject unilateral study. So what that means is within the subjects, they're controlling for variables by splitting up exercise and program design on one body part. So what I mean by that is they took some lifters and they had 16 lifters who were average trained experience of five years or more. And they were basically training one leg with 22 sets of quad work per week. And they're training the other leg with a 20% increase of volume based on what they were doing before the study started. So the researchers interviewed the subject. They asked them how many quad sets per week are you averaging? And what they did is they increased one leg's volume by 20% and the other one was set at a standard 22 sets. And what did the study find? Well, just also to add for some people, the, uh, the 22 set that was a set standard for one leg um that was an increase for some people so that was an increase in volume for some people up to yeah. what was it like a 120 percent increase in volume while for some it was actually a decrease um and then the other leg was By an 50%. actual 20 percent increase in volume yeah so the reason why we're, we're mentioning that is it's kind of showing this idea that for some people, the set volume range was a huge increase or a huge decrease, or it was about the same based on what they were previously doing. And what the results basically found was that the, the, the lifter's leg that was trained at a 20% increase based on their previous training volume saw significant more cross-sectional area, which was used or, or excuse me, examined by, um, uh, what was it, ultrasound. ultrasound, which is a lot more consistent than measurements. I couldn't remember if it was biopsy or ultrasound. So that's a lot more consistent than say doing skin fold measurements or, or actual girth measurements of a leg. And so there was more cross-sectional area of growth in the leg that was being trained at 20% total volume increase from their pre-training volume. And then the other leg that was at 22 sets, for some people that was an increase, some that was a decrease, and some that was a, a, like kind of like in between. It was like a moderate you know, wash of, of total volume. But I think this is in interesting, or actually I'll, I'll wait to give my input. What, what do you guys kind of take from this study? And I think what can they take at home away from hearing these results? I think uh, the biggest takeaway is that there's no magical number in terms of like how many sets you absolutely need to do yes. uh, for whatever body part you're trying to grow. It, what's more important is what have you done before, you know, and how do we progressively overload that? If you're somebody who's doing like five sets a week on, I don't know, yeah, your quads or some shit, and then you automatically jump to like 30, yeah, sure, more, but like, that's a lot. So I feel like you, you just get fucking fried at that point. And like, who the fuck wants to do, who the fuck wants to jump from five to 30? I wouldn't want to fucking do that. Yeah. So, and, and so again, I think a lot of people are going to say, well, no shit. Yes. Yeah. Right. But how often do you actually take these parameters into effect when you're starting a program? And how often do we hear people use the terms MRV, MAV, blah, blah, blah. Like usually those terms, when you look into the deeper, you know, uh, outputs that, that Mike is telling some of the people have coined these terms have given the definitions. They will say you can alter your MRV or MAV, things like that based on your training 
uh, current training work capacity and, and workload that you're doing. But I think a lot of people start to think of these volume allotments of what is optimal for muscle growth mm. or strength gains in a sense of a hard set number or range. Right. Yeah. Your back responds really well to 12 to 20 sets per week. Yeah. One, that range is humongous. Like, yes. yeah. that, you know and what I mean? Like we were talking about the previous podcast, what the fuck does the back even mean? Yeah, the back, yeah. right? Like the back, like a yeah. whole bunch of muscles back there, right? And and then likewise, you know, like what, what does that information actually give you? And I know in my training experience, I've had programs where I'm doing a ton of volume per lift or per muscle group per week. And I've saw great results. And I've also recently, my current program has me at some of the lowest volumes I've ever done as far as total sets per targeted body part and lift have gone. And I've seen more results this training cycle than I have in years now. Mm -hmm. And there's merit to both of these ideas, but I think what this is really painting is there is no magical number or range. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be based on what you're doing. Yeah, it's very dependent on the current situation of your body, not necessarily mm-hmm. like, I think we paint this narrative for ourselves. like I only respond to high volume, whatever that may be, yeah. or I don't respond well to high volume, like I've done that in the past for myself, whereas if you actually look at my programming over the past like number of years, I've been training for like what, 10 years now, yeah. um, I've done every type of like high volume, low volume, high intensity, high exertion, everything, and I've responded well to all different types. So it really just depends on your current level of adaptation and readiness and state of, I don't know, fitness, I yeah, guess you could say. capacity and mm-hmm. everything. So, so let's dive this a little quicker. What do we do with our athletes when they first come to us? What's some of the beginning information pieces we get to create their program around something that is optimal? Because we definitely strive for optimal. I don't want people to think I'm saying there's no, this is ambiguous, there's no optimal range. You have to just do based on kind of what you have been doing or whatever, but what are some of the the pieces of information we do to set up an optimal program? The first things I ask is like, how many sets of squats, bench, and deadlift do you do on like a weekly Mm -hmm. basis? Like what's your average? Um, Like I said in like my previous example, if you're only averaging like five sets of squats per week, you know, I'm not just gonna outright give you 30 or some shit. And how many of those athletes actually know that number off the top? They don't. They almost (laughs) never do. They they start sitting there and they're like counting. And and so it shows you people don't even take into account their current work capacity. When we say work capacity, it's just how much you're recovering from. That's kind of what I broadly mean. They don't take into fact their total workload per muscle group or lift. And that tells me so much about the way they view what is optimal. Mm-hmm. And and so then you can get into the dicey territory too of, of uh, other things with program design. Like if someone does a cookie cutter program, <laughs> that may work great for some people right. and for other people it may not work at all because maybe they started it at way too low of a volume threshold right. or too high and now they're reducing total volume. And that's really what you see if you look at the details of this research paper, there was so much variance between the people who did 22 sets of quads per week. To me, that sounds really high, but a few of the athletes, uh, one of them actually had a 50% total volume <laughs> reduction from his current workload he was doing on his quads. That means he reduced his total workload from 44 sets to 22 yeah, sets. Jesus. That is absolutely insane. So, so do we know the results of his? I, individually, you can see it in, in the research paper. I don't remember it off the top of my head. I'll have to go take a look later. Um, but I, I can almost assure you he probably like lost size yeah. or at worst made Yeah, change. actually, yeah. that's so funny. Cause I just had a consultation this morning. I mean, okay, so this is a little different because it's more powerlifting focused, but... I think the um, same ideas apply to strength though, honestly, at least what we're generating from yeah. this. But go ahead. So she was telling me, because I was asking her, you know, like what, what kind of programming have you done in the past? She's had to take like a six month break due to this shutdown but um she was telling me about her first coach and how like before she started with him she was doing her own like programming it was kind of random to be honest but it was like higher volume and then when she started with him um she noticed she like felt a lot weaker and her her lifts actually decreased really fast because she didn't feel like it was enough volume for her just because when she started or before she started with him it was a lot more so I think so just the amount of stimulus. Took a step back in total volume. Right. If anything, she was desensitizing herself. And maybe that'll set up a good cycle after. Right. But this is a common mistake with coaches and athletes, whether it's a coach or athlete designing a program for themselves or a trainee. Mm-hmm. They tend to only look at like what they know is optimal, right? Like what right. are the, yeah. the optimal ranges for, for you know sets on quads per week or how many sets of squats should I be doing per week? But they don't think of what they were currently doing. And this is what one of the biggest regrets I have with my Submax DUP free program out there. It's a powerlifting program. 
is I, I said it in the videos, but I didn't do a good job hammering home that if you're not an intermediate and don't know how to rate your RPs and uh, most of all, you're not trained for this kind of program, you shouldn't be doing it. Because if off the top of my head, I think it's something about like 13 hard sets of squats per week, they're pretty challenging. Even the power day is pretty heavy. Yeah, no, I remember seeing that. I was like, Brendan, what the fuck? Yeah, it's it's definitely a, what I call a baby. We should program. all do it one day <laughs> oh and my see God. how well. <laughs> I think my knees would snap. Yeah, it's definitely an intense program. I feel like I would do well on it. I don't know. Well, it's actually based off a program I ran myself that I just modified to fit a large amount of people. That's one of the main things I took into account. The hardest thing about creating a cookie cutter program to fit mass amounts of people that you're not going to have individual you know, customization with mm -hmm. Yeah. Is I have to figure out how can I make sure everyone gets stronger, but also make sure people don't get injured, and then also make sure that people aren't getting weaker. Right. It's a really hard look. Yeah. You go yeah. one way too far in any direction, and you're you're either not getting results or you're overtraining or you know whatever. And so mm -hmm. it's really hard to do. And luckily, I've heard a lot of people modify it slightly. They kind of look at it, and some people know like, okay, this is a lot more than what I was doing. Let me pull back this day a little bit, which is actually not a bad thing to do if you do it in an intelligent way. But I wish I would have hammered home the idea like hey you need to be used to the style of training and training near these kind of volumes before you dive into it if someone's coming off 531 I think that was one of the examples I used in my old videos they can't jump from 531 doing like six sets of squats per week into this crazy sub max yeah. DUP volume class that I have them right, doing. Right. And so you got to make sure you're always getting trained slowly. Mm -hmm. And so so let's define optimal then real quick because I do think there is such a thing as optimal volume how do we go about stating what is optimal for a lifter? What would you describe to someone at home as optimal and how do we carry that out in the training? Hmm. I can start there if you want. You can, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead, yeah. Uh, you you want to go? Right. I mean, I was just going to say, I think optimal, it, it, it depends on the context of, it will always depend on the context of your previous training. So yes. what have you been doing in the past? I think that's the biggest like point there. Um, and then what, what would you do as far as like a number? Like, do you think 20%, and obviously we don't know this, there, there, this is one of the only scientific experiments I know of that's taken into account pre-training volume levels. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm gonna dive into the rest of the studies out there on optimal training volume, because there's a lot of misinformation that people have kind of construed, misconstrued, but um, what would you define as an optimal amount? Do you think 20 to 30%, that's a good, safe increase, do you think a large increase, like fifty percent, is survivable for a short period of time, but long term is not. Like I think it's a. I like to do a slower ramp up. So okay. it's like, I think fifty percent is a little too much. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think if we're trying to like overreach and just you know hammer you with a bunch of volume, I think like gradually increasing it by like 10, 20 yeah. percent. At, at like at the most, maybe. Yeah. Um, nowhere near, nowhere beyond like 30% or like 50%. Yeah. I think it's way too much. I've, I've averaged it out with my trainees. Well, I'm going to move this a little bit closer to you. I've averaged this out with my trainees and they basically always get about a 20% increase in volume with yeah. me. There are times where I'm really aggressive and yeah, I'll do yeah. four weeks of like a large like 50% increase, but I never do that long term because yeah. I always find they get injured. What will happen is they get these crazy freaking games and in back honestly when i was a newer coach i made this mistake mm -hmm. all the time i would take someone especially way back in the day no mm -hmm. one was doing dup and i was one of the first coaches really like playing with higher volumes more sub max approach excuse me and uh this coffee's getting me again and what what ended yeah up i'm fucking hyped up right now I, I really am <laughs> i'm just like <laughs> yeah we take way too much caffeine <laughs> pre-recording <laughs> i know um so anyway, I would take athletes and I would hammer them with volume and they would see these crazy strength gains mm -hmm. in the short term, but then they would end up getting injured after, you know, like four to six weeks of it yeah. and I would have to pull back and then redo it. And then I, I finally learned my lesson after a couple of years of coaching, like, oh crap, I got to think about what they were doing pre-lift or yeah. pre-training experience. So I think at some times like optimal can be a huge 50% increase if the person's like four weeks out and you've been doing some pretty moderate stuff for a little while, they made some good strength gains, but you mm -hmm. want to skyrocket their squat real quick. If you want to take a roll of the dice, give them like a 40, 50% increase. I've definitely done that and it's worked out well, but you have to manage it. That's not long-term yeah. sustainable. No, that's yeah. definitely short-term. I mean, you can only increase so much for a certain period of time before it's like 
what you're doing like 50 sets of squats a yes. week like you can't keep doing that obviously mm -hmm. so let's move on to that too yeah. Let, let's talk about uh, since we're, we're saying optimal is basically always increasing based on what you're doing mm -hmm. is there a point where we decrease volume to desensitize the athlete definitely I well, think even uh, within meso cycles like I'll taper it just a little bit too so I'll like ramp it up and then I'll bring it back down and then kind of ramp it back up again what, how, how long do you ramp for so how many training cycles do you think you'll you'll run through let's talk more long term like a macro cycle uh, or when we say macro cycles powerlifting coaches everyone has different you know interpretations of that the traditionally trained exercise student is going to say a macro cycle is a year of training but yeah. um, you know to us a macro cycle is a total training cycle bringing someone into a meet or some kind of goal of theirs so that could be like three or four you know little meso cycles strung yeah. together in a you know six month four month kind of time frame but uh, to, how how often through each training cycle do you ramp volume and then at what point do you usually pull back? Like what, what are the distinguishing factors for you guys with your athletes when deciding upon the volume? <laughs> you want me to take it? Uh, uh, to think about this. Go ahead. Okay. Well, for me, it's always going to be like an increase for a long time until we see diminishing returns and until we see kind of those side effects of pain and stuff starting mm. to come about. So you're saying you keep increasing volume? Yeah, I, I kind of keep going. Like if, if the gains are there, yeah, and, and sometimes I don't necessarily increase, but I keep them level, right? Yeah, like yeah, if yeah. I'm making gains off, off, you know, 20 sets of, of quad work, 12 of those being squats, and you know, the rest of it, uh, the, the last eight sets being like direct quad work per week on a belt squat and leg extensions, and, and they're floating there, I'm gonna keep them there. And then if we need to bump it a little bit more before a meet, I can bump it a little past that, but at some point, obviously, there gets to be just too much. Right. And and at that point, that's where I'm going to kind of desensitize and bring them back way back to square one, and then move forward. And then we can talk about the resensitization phases here in a little bit. Yeah, my indication to stop pushing volume is when like minor aches start uh, coming up, like random yeah. little aches. I'm like, okay, it's time to pull back, uh, and then kind of hold you there for a little bit until it kind of goes away almost. Yeah. Um, and do, do you always see that those kind of follow a – I always find when the aches come, their progress is just, like, slow. Yeah. Or if not stopping. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Either because, like, e either they're just plateauing because of strength or they just end up getting hurt yeah. in one way or another. And it's like, okay, we really need to pull back now. Yeah. What, what about you? That what? actually happened to me. Remember, we were benching, like, what, four times a week? And oh, it was yeah, just yeah, yeah. plateaued. Like, it wasn't going anywhere. If anything, it was getting worse. So yeah. we completely pulled back. I think we're actually at five times a week. Yeah, we? it was a lot. I don't remember. It was a lot. But it anyways. Was a lot of volume. But you made a lot of gains up until that point. I think we, because we got you that, uh, was a 154 pound bench press in competition at 52 kilos, which is decently strong for you. Uh, me and you are not built for the bench press. So that was like a huge PR. <laughs> yeah. And then we pulled you back to how many times a week benching here recently after that? Two? Yeah. Yeah, two. Two times. And I felt like crap. Mm -hmm. Bench felt like <laughs> shit. I hate bench, or I hated bench, and now it's starting to finally pick up again because, like, we desensitized me and then resensitized me, and so. So we can kick into the yeah. mentality aspect here, but but <laughs> how were you feeling during that desensitization phase? Like, as far as, like, your mentality towards bench press? I <laughs> bad i kind of wanted to skip it and i kind of mentally did to be honest like i would go in and be like this is just pointless like why am i doing this so we're, we're gonna talk about mentality here in a little bit i feel like you two are polar opposites with mentality i'm kind yeah, of a little that. in the middle of the road you're like a little too crazy sometimes but you've learned well lately yeah you, you yeah. haven't been overshooting a lot or anything yeah. like that lately you're kind of the one who i think pulls back too much gets a little i have a lot like, to say about that so we'll go into okay. that okay we'll talk about that yeah. um but but yeah so so desensitization phases i think can be extremely beneficial for power lifters and bodybuilders at some point pragmatically alone you just can't keep doing more right. you're not going to be able to fit in yeah. a workout of 20 five sets of quad work this workout yeah. and then work out two you gotta go do another 20 sets you do double like days that. double days yeah screw Fuck that it. so just start benching eight times a week Kristen. eight times a week right twice a day six days a week um but but no okay so like you got to pull back at some point 
And when we do that is usually when we start to see a decline mm -hmm. or at least the signs showing a decline. I think now we're all pretty good at catching it before it really starts to happen. You start noticing those top sets are kind of flattening yeah, out. Yeah. They're like, hey, my you know, brachioradialis and the low bar is kind of feeling beat mm -hmm. up. Oh, it feels kind of creaky getting the Especially whole Especially with like longer term athletes where you just kind yeah. of know you have that feeling of like, okay, I think mm -hmm. now is the time to pull it. back. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're just like, ah, I just know that top set should be better this week. So mm -hmm. then we pull back. And then they got to bite that bullet of kind of like, okay, right now we're not gaining. Mm -hmm. We're not making strength gains. We're not making muscle size gains. We are pulling back and we are going to go focus on other goals. Now, there's a lot of ways to do this. I think the way that I enjoy doing it the most is kind of just focusing on secondary goals, right? Mm -hmm. Things that can help you maybe long term. So if we have someone who's just a straight up power lifter, we know muscle mass can directly correlate to more neurological adaptation long term. Yeah. The amount of muscle mass is one of the main indicators for strength differences between trainees, right? We have empirical evidence showing this. And so, you know, even though powerlifters don't always want to train like bodybuilders, they want to just focus on getting the big three stronger. Why? <laughs> you know, right? uh, but at some point we're gonna have to pull back and that's the perfect time to then think about those muscle building, you know, goals. So, so maybe we, we've been really squat centric. Maybe we've mm -hmm. been really quad centric, right? Doing a lot of squats, a lot of belt squats. Your squats really plateauing. So shift the focus of the lift. Right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So pull back on the squats. Maybe put the precedent on upper body mass and bench press for a little bit, or just upper body mass and lower body mass in general, but without overdoing the squats. Right. Or if it's a hybrid lifter who's mm -hmm. concerned with both size and strength. That one gets a little tricky because now you're doing a lot of total barbell work per week on the, the main three and you're doing total accessory work. Yeah. So, so now you got to kind of pull back everything, right? We got to reduce size and reduce strength response in the yeah. short term. That's why power building is very hard to do. Oh God, it's so, it's so much harder to program yeah. for power builders. I than think it's lifters. better to almost just periodize your uh, goals, like you're saying. Yes, yes. Focus and on so one thing at a time. When we pull back, maybe we start thinking about work capacity, right? So even though we know, okay, we're pulling back and we're going to pull back on the total amount of squat sets per week, total amount of quad work per mm -hmm. week, and then maybe even bench and deadlift got to get pulled back too. All three of them are too high. What can we do instead? Well, hey, we've only been doing sets of like six to eight tops on, on squats, mostly focusing on heavy singles and really heavy back downs. And then the belt squat gets your volume in. Well, let's hit up some high bar work for really high reps, sets of 10 to 12 or something. Get their freaking intra set work capacity super high. Get their energy yeah. capacity super high. Build up some tolerance to then fucking blast yeah. them like crazy. Out That's how I've been time. treating uh, my current like training mm -hmm. cycles too. Cause like I'm doing high bar sets of 10 or nine and like first week I was like, okay, this sucks. But I was like, okay, this is actually really fun. Cause now I get to focus on how much total work I'm doing in one session and like how fast I can like kind of bang it out too. And how, how, how different do you feel from one week? What are, I guess, what are the adaptation feelings you're experiencing, right? So maybe like you're not getting stronger from like week to week because of like, oh, my strength is going yeah. up. But does, doesn't it feel like you can feel that work capacity Yeah, increase? like doing nines is a fucking breeze right now. I fucking yeah. like doing rep work in general just feels fucking great. And week one, I bet it was trash. Yeah, no, week one it was like, I think I hit 365 for 10. And I was like, okay, my both my quads and my cardio is giving out. And then, and then the next week I was like, okay, now my cardio is holding up and it's my quads that are gassing. Yeah. And it just kind of like progresses over time. Yep. And... Go ahead. There's also a mental aspect too because you're kind of excited. Yeah, now I'm more excited. Like, so now I'm like, kind of go into like it was like sets of ten. Them. I feel like a lot of people are like, I don't want to fucking do that. And it's like, why are you being a bitch? Yes, yes. <laughs> so you just started really, really high volume phase two. We were just doing, were we doing high bar tens the other day and yeah. uh, front squat tens too on a, a third squat day. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. I'm fucking hella fun. sore though. I feel like a newbie, <laughs> yeah. but it feels good. I actually. Like my cardio is probably not the best right now. I'm kind of out of shape, but she's bulking <laughs> from a bulk. Um, You're definitely out of shape though from that work. Yeah, capacity. you know because we have we weren't doing anything like that. I think we were doing singles, and singles and no doubles and a few high reps. That's a high bar here and there, but it was yeah. descending uh, reps with ascending loads. It was more stuff. intensity focused. Yeah, yeah, we weren't really pushing the RPs on those higher rep sets. So, so the the point I'm trying to make here mm -hmm. is let's focus on different goals. Okay, we can't push the set volume too high mm -hmm. each week on whether it be a squat or direct quad work, but maybe we can push your, your energy capacity goal, right? And that's yeah. what you're experiencing. 
And so you can start making gains in different ways while you're technically reducing total set volume, which I think set volume really is the, the key for like judging optimal training volume levels. Rep volume doesn't play that much of an indicator. We know we can get growth from low rep sets, high rep sets, doesn't matter. Of course, the extremes of you know 30 plus reps and three reps or less are, are kind of out of that picture. But when you're generally speaking between three and 20 reps mm -hmm. on a lift, you can make gains as long as the exertion and total set volume are set correctly. Mm -hmm. So it's the total sets per week mm -hmm. that I think really matter for optim optimality, right? For yeah. growth, what is the optimal zone? And so we got to really figure out, okay, we're pulling back on, on total sets for squats, total sets of, you know, leg extension and stuff. Or frequency. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or frequency, which will directly affect that. Mm. And so, but now let's focus on those goals of capacity. That way you just become a tank. And so you can almost still make some gains. You can be mentally excited. I think people get training. scared to move away from that. I don't know why. They think they're going to lose their gains, right? No. And like, what are you doing? You're setting yourself up for future gains, right? Yeah. It's like the exact gonna... opposite of what's happening. Exactly. Yeah. It's part of the process of getting stronger. It's kind of like a deload. No one wants to do it, but you sometimes need to do it. That way you set yourself up for those future weeks to go really, really hard. I think that was probably one of my biggest mistakes is I had a hard time taking little deloads or even my wave loads. Mm -hmm. How I, often do you deload? Or now I deload every do? four weeks just about. So it's planned out. Yeah, it's kind of, it, it's, it's still a wave load, but it's like a part, it's like in between a deload and a wave load. And just to define those for people at home real quick, excuse me, it's coffee. The deload is gonna be like total reduction of workload in a dramatic fashion. Something like 25% at minimum whether it be volume, exertion, whatever, we're pulling back in a lot of different ways. A wave load is like a smaller, like, you know, 15% reduction, usually mostly exertion based, not even really total set volume based, maybe a set or two off here and there, just to give you a little quick break to get right back into hard training. I respond well to pretty harsh deloads. So I've built in a deload system on the power building routine I'm using. Um, I don't have my athletes doing this, but I know for me personally, I just mm -hmm. need to do it because I'm at such advanced levels that I have to deload every four weeks. So for me, I take a step back every four weeks, but mm -hmm. I realize after that step back for a week, it fucking sucks doing it. I'm super bored in the gym. Oh yeah. <laughs> but then it's like, dude, I can Do just you take fucking deloads? crush it. Well, no, that's how I feel whenever I peak. So I remember yeah. the week before I tested, I was just like, okay, it's a two by two at like, I don't know, 68% on my deadlift. I'm like, I don't want to fucking do this. But like, I know I kind of have to. Like it, it it's like what you were saying about bench. It's like, why am I doing this? It's like, it's kind of pointless, but you kind of have to do it anyways. It's part of the process. Yeah, those steps process, have yeah. to be in place in order to make those gains. Um, so desensitization phases, we pull back. Now resensitize, I guess we can talk about, you know, the peaks and valleys, right? So for me personally, I usually start pulling back at like, you know, maybe 15 hard sets of squats per week or 13, 12, somewhere around there. That was like my highest under Brad. Uh, Brad Culliard has coached me a while back. We got up to somewhere around like, I think 12 to 15 sets of hard squats per week. That's a lot for you. That's a lot for me. Yeah. Like for me, that's so much. I don't respond very well to volume. So I built the shit out of my capacity to get up there. And I, I did well. I did well at the meet. Went, um, I think eight for nine at that meet. Oh, seven for nine because that stupid bench rule. Mm -hmm. But I don't, eight for nine. it's basically yeah. eight for nine. There's a dumb rule in the US. Everybody hates rule. that rule. Yeah, it needs to go away. But, but it was basically, I made the lifts from a strength standard, um, but it was technically a seven for nine uh, meet, and I had great PRs on all the lifts, but the, the thing there was I was doing so much, I had to pull back. Currently, I'm literally doing about half that work mm. and still making gains. The difference is, is where my training level's at. So uh, peaks and valleys, what, what, I guess, what's the lowest volume you've ever responded to on the main lifts or body mm. parts, and then what's the highest we've pushed you to? I'm thinking more, I know in that November meet, we mm -hmm. pushed you, uh, or sorry, no, the July meet back. That was a rough meet because the water. Well, I know right. currently, or this past training cycle, we took off too much volume and my lifts just tanked a little bit. Yeah. Remember? But overall. There was more the rep volume, though, and a few other things. I'm talking more, I guess, just your total set. amount of set volume and, like, how much you're doing at different points going to different meets. Um, I think the last, not the last meet, but the meet before that was it was a pretty high volume and i was hitting yeah. a lot of prs yeah it was just a bad meat experience <laughs> it was a bad meat. she had a really rough water cut we tried a new water cut style uh at the recommendation of someone and it just didn't work and like we were miserable trying to get her to sauna up till minutes before the meet she literally had to get out of the sauna try to weigh in still didn't make weight because that scale was wrong by the way but we had like literal calibrated plates weighing wrong on that scale but anyway it's a rant for another time but basically we ended up 
um, you, you like lifted, I think like in five minutes. Like, okay, sorry guys, the camera cuts out in 30 minute increments. I, I apologize, I promise we're gonna get better gear. It's just really expensive and we're really thin on budget for this stuff. <laughs> um, just being super upright. We've spent so much money these last months. But anyway, getting back to the, the train volume. So peaks and valleys, um, I peaked out and valleyed out at completely different zones. Like I have a huge gap between my peak volume I can handle and then currently where I'm still responding really well to my low end. I want to talk about yours though. So where, where has been the peak for you as far as training volume goes? And I'm kind of thinking more of that 2019 meet back in last July. Mm -hmm. um, going into that meet, you're doing a lot of squat volume and then comparing that to maybe more recent times, how much squat volume we're doing. I think going into that, that meet, I think I was doing up to 13 to 15 sets of squats specifically. And that's when my squats were actually gaining the most momentum and then um for deadlifts even i think it was like i know i was deadlifting twice a week yeah. um i can't remember the exact amount of volume but um it was pretty high yeah and it was very specific it was mm -hmm. all sumo and then your bench i think it was like four even times bench was a lot too so mm -hmm. that was actually a really good cycle just the meat didn't turn out very well for That's other reasons bullshit. but um and then as far as like low volume i've responded as much as little as like I don't know, squatting twice a week, maybe like six sets of squats a week, yeah. I would say. Yeah. So I, I'm the, kind of the same way where I've responded to different levels of volume. And even way back in the day, let's say going back into that, that first meet you ever did, how many sets were you doing back then? Because you had been training for a while <laughs> yeah. before that. You did a meet pretty late. Like that was so. a lot of volume as well, I yeah. believe. And then the meet yeah. after that, you're doing a lot less volume, I think, right? The Candido program, which is, I think, what, like six or seven, eight sets maybe of squats per week? Uh, yeah, but there was this weird random AMRAP day, <laughs> but anyways, yeah. uh, oh, but that one, I actually responded well the first, cause it's six weeks. So the first six weeks I responded well, and then I retried it again and didn't make any progress. Um, actually kind of, my lifts kind of tanked a little bit. So that's a huge point. That's there, another right? point I was going to make earlier. So, um, people will try to like look back at their old training cycles and be like, oh look, I responded really well to this. We should try this again or try to repeat like, you know, programs or blocks or something. And it, it's like, you can't get the same effect because you're in a different state yes, than you completely. were before. So it's like, you can't keep repeating the same thing. You'll like probably notice. But you've already notice. made those adaptations. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe you, that was a while ago mm. and you're nowhere near that level anymore. Right. Your work capacity is lower. Right. Your, your total tolerance is lower. You try to repeat that and it just goes haywire. Right. I've seen that happen to a lot of people mm. going into nationals last year. Uh, I remember talking to a few athletes who come to mind that were, were kind of basing their training around what they had done previously. Yeah. And I tried to kind of warn them a little ahead of time, like, hey, you know, like that was a different time. That was yeah. a different phase of your adaptation. You know, that was a different level of work capacity. Like you might want to go a little bit more out of regulated or based on what you have been doing. And the, the ones who, you know, didn't take the advice, sure enough, that kind of happened to them. Mm -hmm. And so it's, there's, you're never in the same state. My current level of adaptation to my total volume tolerance, to my strength levels, to my, even my energy demands, mm -hmm. right? Like how, how hard are those sets attend to me currently on high bar? If they're super stressful and that's just killing you out yeah. from a capacity standpoint, that's going to cost you so much in recovery as where if it's a breeze to me, you're trained for it. Yeah. You're going to be able to handle more. Yeah. Right, and so you you're never in the same state twice. You have to always base on your current level of data and where your body is at. What about you? What's some of the highest volumes you've responded to, and what's some of the lowest volumes you've responded? I to? think we've pushed about 13, 12 or thirteen sets of squats a yeah. week, leading up to like a meet or just like a, a test day in the gym. Mm -hmm. um, the lowest we've gone is probably anywhere six to eight. I think yeah. that's probably like one of the more recent blocks we've ran where we decided to take a break on squat and just yeah. focus on like my front yeah. squat. And Didn't it, you guys were pushing it pretty hard and then I remember you just kind of hit, yeah, yeah. hit a wall and yeah. you kind of felt like crap. Yeah, front squats are doing really well, but like my back squat was just kind of like <laughs> floating there. And I'm yeah. like, that's fine. I mean, I, I was aware that that was probably yeah. gonna happen. And then I think you guys pulled back pretty hard, right? And then oh no, oh, that so that was after. So we're talking yeah. about two different times. So the front squat part was when we pulled back. Yes. That's why your back squat wasn't responding. But yeah. we, oh. We yeah, knew yeah. that ahead yeah of time. i didn't give a shit yeah. so basically he had made crazy squat gains and you were doing those 12 to 13 hard sets of squats yeah. per week i was doing like five by twos and like five by threes and i was like brendan what the fuck yeah and uh so he was doing some crazy amount of volume you pr'd your squat but i knew i was like there's no way we're gonna get this out again yeah let's pull back and that was when we thought okay let's focus on the front squat get on some different goals mm -hmm. work postural strength 
work work capacity, right? Yeah. For volume, work some different things we're not used to training. You have to pull back. Your, your front squat responded well because it was a novel stimulus. You hadn't yeah. done it in a while. Yeah. You hit a PR there really easy too, by yeah. the way. And then your um, your back squat though took a back burner, but that yeah. was to be expected to the phase. Now what's happening with your back squat? It's going Yeah, it's crazy. going great, yeah. And this is the phase after yeah. that. So we take the step back, resensitize them a little bit, get them used to lower volume tolerance. Yeah, level. like six to eight sets, and now mm -hmm. I'm doing like anywhere of like ten to twelve again, almost. Exactly. I think a little less than that, but like maybe. eight to ten yeah. or so. And then we're, we're going to probably bump that to ten to twelve, and then maybe a little bit beyond that. And and that's that that stab in a way mm -hmm. the volume. So you stab up for a little bit, and then you pull back, stab up some more, pull back, and and you have to do this. There's no. Do you way always this. have to be increasing, or can you? No. So if you're still um, adapting or making progress with the set level of volume, do mm -hmm. you need to, can you keep it the same? I guess my question would be, or should you keep trying to build off of that? No, so I think you got to look at response, but I definitely will keep it the same often. Why do more if you're responding to right, less, yeah. right? So that's the other thing too. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess we shouldn't tell people it's always about doing more. Right. It's doing more when it makes sense to, mm -hmm. but you can float, I would say for at least, you know, eight to 10, maybe even 12 weeks at the same volume. At some point you will need to change it. You, you either always have to change stimulus or, or change volume right. amount. There, there has to be a change mm -hmm. in adaptation. Mm -hmm. You can't just always overload. The way I kind of look at it, I, I don't know about you guys, but it, this is how I kind of conceptualize it in my mind is that when we're floating at like say maybe eight <clears throat> sets of squats per week, we're just there for eight weeks or whatever it's gonna be, it's what's leading those adaptations mm -hmm. are the things like adapting to the volume levels, adapting the strength. So each week we're kind of upping the dose of the top set, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's like week number one, they hit 500 for five. Week number two, they hit 515 for five. Week three, 530 for five. That, that planned in progression, which is different than progressive overload, that's planned progression in a program, that is allowing the adaptations to take place. Mm -hmm. At some point though, that'll kind of run out and so to stimulate more, we'll do the planned progressions and then maybe bump the set volume by a couple sets, you know, add 20% load or something, or volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah? Yeah. Thoughts on that or are you good? No, no, that sounds all right. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's keep moving on. So what do you guys do as far like, let's give them some takeaways at home. Let's talk maybe about cookie cutter programs real quick before mm -hmm. we leave the subject. And then let's also talk about um, like maybe customizing programs for someone, right? Like, so if someone's building their program at home, I have a lot of videos on how to do that. What, where do you guys usually start a person as far as volume, frequency, just exercise design goes in a program? Do you like starting at one time a week on the lifts, two times a week, three times? For me, uh, I think I, to, as a good starting point, so I break it down as like the lifts. So for squat frequency, I typically start with probably two, uh, two times a week squatting at the most. So depending on the lifter, of course, and then um, bench typically two to three times. Um, probably two to start maybe and then for deadlifts honestly just one time a week um, and then from there okay. you can build off of that so I would start with the least amount that you need to and then you know every four to eight weeks increase frequency so basically try to get away with as little as you can before you need to increase yes and so for me like I, I'm gonna keep it pretty simple three to four sets per day and if you're doing twice a week that means, you know, six to eight sets per week right. on those lifts. I usually like with women, um, three times a week to start on bench and then twice a week yeah. on like the taller kind of bigger guys and stuff and yeah. then jump up from there. I rarely have big guys like me or you bench mm -hmm. more than three times a week, unless it's like a really off variation or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but girls, I can get up to maybe four or five times a week on bench mm -hmm. uh, or even smaller males. And, and so that will allow a lot of room for progression. So we start at three and then when volume's kind of getting too much and we can only add so many sets per day, then maybe we increase frequency. Mm -hmm. uh, back to what you were saying earlier, frequency is really a moderator of volume, right? Yeah. So like for you, when do you decide, like how many sets per day? And I, this is kind of a weird question, but I feel like everyone has the same answer to this question, even mm -hmm. though many people want to answer it. But how many sets will you be willing to do, and let's say per lift, on one given training day for each lift? So let's say squat, how, what's the most amount of sets on one day that you'll program for a squat? Probably, I guess including the top set, maybe like five or six. That's exactly what I would say. Is that the same for you? 
<laughs> yeah, I think so. Five Wait, to six. I really think everyone has the same yeah. answers. This minus on bench will get. A I was crazy, gonna say four to five. Yeah, four to five. <laughs> you know what's funny though is like, <laughs> um, when I'm sometimes this is gonna sound really unprofessional. Sometimes when I'm writing someone's program, I'll like imagine myself doing it, and I'll be like, does this sound like a lot of volume or not? You know? No, no, no. I think Do you know what I mean? coach totally does yeah, that deep it's down. It's kind of funny. I'm like, damn, that's a lot. They're no, gonna no, die. sometimes I'll even, I'll even perceive. So usually if I'm like planning like an intensity zone yeah. based on their RPEs, I'm kind of thinking like, okay, that's Pragmatically, doable, yeah. But like, okay, this lifter is really strong. I'm really strong. And then I'll do the math on like <laughs> yeah. what weight I would be using. And I'm like, is that pragmatically something I could tackle? Right. Like would the they mindset? want to do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah like yeah, like yeah. is this something yeah. like, like sure they could do 500 for a five by five yeah. back off, but can they mentally handle yeah. that without right. being like, fuck this? And imagine doing like a six by five with that. I yeah, think yeah, I yeah, fucking yeah. shoot myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine doing that. So so the reason I asked that though is I think this there's actually kind of a limit on how many sets per day you can do. Obviously the the outstanding examples out there of like something like a Shaco program, Shaco, however you want to say it. Oh yeah. Uh, that that's gonna be so sub max that you could do like eight sets that's of, true. of exercise. But we're talking about sets that are usually between RP5 to as much as RP10. Like actual nine. hard sets. Yeah, like yeah. hard working sets that could be sub-maximal-ish, mm -hmm. but not so sub-max that it's like a breeze and you could do eight sets of it. Right? Yeah, yeah. So for me, squat is going to be about five to six sets tops. Six being like a top set with five back downs. This is per right. day, yeah. right? Per day, yes. Yeah. Now per week, that, that's why I'm asking this is because that mm. will give us the answer of when we increase frequency, Yeah. right? So, so squat's going to be five to six. Bench is going to be maybe six to seven. I might get crazy and do a top set with like six back downs, like a six by four. But that's going to be at the peak of volume. Yeah. And then for me, deadlift, it's going to be about four to five tops. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. five tops for Usually like, like four is kind of like a top set with like three to maybe a sumo pull or four back down hard sets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's about it. I just don't see the need for more. And so then when I surpass that, and I think most coaches would probably agree with what we just said, when we surpass that, then it's like, okay, we need to increase volume, but we ran out on this day. We can't right. add a set to right. either day. How do we do that? You increase add another frequency. Day. Right. Yep. Yeah, I agree. And so you'll pull back when? So we start it two times a week on squat and deadlifts one time a week. Mm -hmm. Bench is, is three times a week. When at the point of adding volume and frequency, which is really the same thing, when do you kind of pull back? I guess from a frequency standpoint, what is too much? It honestly, depends on the lifter. So of course, but yeah. but where's usually your top end? I guess where's uh, the most you're willing oh, to go. Honestly, I've never programmed more than three times a week squatting. Yeah. Uh, as far as volume goes, that can range from like six to fifteen to twenty sets, maybe. Yeah. Um, and then bench. Some people can handle benching every day, um, but the most I think I've ever programmed is five times a week. Yeah. And then deadlift, um, only two times a week still. Like even if we went from one to two, I would only probably keep it at two. There's really no reason to keep it or to make it more than that. So yeah, um, there's definitely a limit as far as frequency and volume goes, and then you have to pull back, desensitize, and then build that back up again. What about you? How, how, what, at what point of frequency do you think, okay, this is just too much? I guess really what's the highest you've ever programmed frequency wise for the squat, the bench, and the deadlift? Three times a week for squat, two times a week for deads. Um, I think the most I've ever programmed for bench is like four to five. I don't really have a lot of females. I, I usually yeah. just get like guys. Um, so it'll end up being over between like four ish weeks or four. Four, four times, times a week. week. And that's probably for smaller guys usually, right? Yeah, smaller. Yeah. If they're bigger, then it's probably like three. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of the same way. And so that kind of gives you your answer of like like low end and top end as far as like, you know, genetic variance. If we're saying five to six sets tops on bench per week and you're benching five times a week, that's 25 sets of bench per week. Sure, or maybe 30 if you're doing six sets every day, but like at most it's around 25 hard sets of squat or bench per week. That's probably the point you're gonna pull back. Same thing on squats. I'm the same way. Usually speaking in a traditional program, three times a week on squats the most for me. Right. I have programmed four times a week squats, but it's more when I'm starting to get into high frequency singles 
like that kind of Bulgarian esque yeah. that I've played around with. Mm-hmm. So that's something so different. That's not really yeah. a traditional. But then volume is getting compensated because you're only doing singles. And you're right. Yeah. So there'll be only maybe two days of actual volume. Yeah. And then four days of total squatting, where two of those days are just singles and yeah. nothing else, yeah. which is really like not invasive on recovery as much as people I think would think it is. Yeah. At least from a muscular standpoint. Well, then should we also talk about the mentality too? Because if you're benching six times a week, oh, like yes. you're gonna go into a couple of those sessions and just be like I don't know how Sean does I don't want to do this and it's gonna be all I don't want to say pointless but uh, you're gonna kind of go about it a little bit differently than if you were to only bench you know three times a week you could push it a little bit more and kind of be more excited about it yeah so there's that too yeah I think I think it depends on the like the part of the phase right when you right. start ramping up say we're just killing someone with mm-hmm. volume it's one of those few times where maybe we ramp up a lot of volume we're like hey we got four weeks till your meet we want to annihilate your fucking pecs and bench let's go five times a week bench increase volume by 50 percent but you're only doing it for a short period of time that can work really well to get someone's bench strong really quickly um, and, and they're probably going to enjoy that in the first four weeks because they're seeing yeah. the gains. They're like, right, right. shit, this thing yeah, is just yeah, flying. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, it's fucking fun. But you go long term with that and it goes back to now that's not like a crazy novel mm-hmm. stimulus. Maybe they're still surviving it and they're not getting beat up and they're not seeing regression, but it's just stale. Kind of, it's just slowly yeah, creeping it's like, stale, like normal training. Yeah. 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 You're going to fucking get bored and you're going to burn out. And so there's, there's a huge mentality aspect, which we really want to talk about mentality in this next part. But I agree. I think that's huge for, yeah. for frequency and volume. So as far as like creating our program or maybe, you know, if you are to get onto like a cookie cutter program yeah um should you try to customize it for yourself then i totally think you can as long as you're keeping the variables the same i love when people come to me and they're like hey i ran your sub max up program but i just cut off the third squat day what's that but they alter it yeah yeah. well if they alter it correctly when they start telling me they added in arms on this day and (laughs) they fucking you know changed around the intensity on this day i'm like why like that makes zero sense (laughs) like why would you download someone's program who's a coach and then you coach the program. That doesn't yeah. make sense. But if you're doing something like just removing a day, because you know, like, hey, three times a week squats right now, I've only been squatting, you know, one and a half times per week. You know, every fifth day I'm squatting and I'm, my volume's at six sets per week. There's no way I can handle mm-hmm. that third squat day. That's a smart move because you're not really changing the program that much. You're just kind of removing a day for recovery. Yeah. Like, while that is a large change in the program, the main fundamentals of the progression stay the same. Right. When you start tweaking with the RPEs and the intensity and the exercise <laughs> selection, that's just changing the program. Yeah, yeah. So I actually totally think if you want to run my Sunbax DUP program, maybe the first time through just twice a week squatting, right? If you're not used to that, that stimulus. Or if you are, run it exactly as written. And then, but next go around, you could add that third squat day. So now you got a little progression with a cookie cutter program. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with 531. They have built in progressions on there. You can do the boring but big option. You can do all these different like customizations of 531. There's so many of them. The first time you run it, maybe it's pretty bare bones, just basic. Second time you add a little frequency of the barbell lifts. Third time you up the volume a little bit more, right? Mm-hmm. Adding in some of those progressions. So I totally think, yeah, you could kind of customize things. You just have to do it the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, moving on to mentality. So question of the day again is how, what, what is the biggest mental hurdle you guys have with lifting? And let's actually just start there with each of us before we even talk about how important mentality is for training. What is your guys' biggest mental hurdle you think for training? I can start if you want. I have a lot. You have a lot? Mm. Go ahead and start. What's your biggest? Uh, <laughs> I overthink everything. So I was gonna. So I was gonna compare my mentality um, when I first started lifting to now what it is now, and how it's kind That's of changed. Comparison. So like, I always talk about how knowledge can too much knowledge can actually like or being too aware of your body and yourself and your state and everything is almost sometimes detrimental to you yes. because um, you start thinking about how does this feel? Can I do this? What does this mean? Like all these things. Whereas if you don't really know and you just kind of go into it without any expectations or any anything really, you, you don't have to think about those aspects. And so you don't have that holding you back. So like in the beginning, I didn't know what an RPE 9 meant. I didn't know like what certain things were so I just went into it and did it without question and so I saw like all these gains really fast but now that I'm like more aware of like 
how I should be moving, how things should be feeling, and all these other things. I like constantly overthink things, and so that can kind of hold me back too. I think both have pros and cons. Yeah. Right? In the beginning, what happened to you with your hip? And just yeah, like, like because I wasn't aware, I just overdid everything, and I moved like crap, and I ended up getting hurt, and then that actually held me back for like six months. I couldn't squat. And then um, likewise, now I'm like too aware <laughs> to where I'm like, does this look perfect? If it doesn't, I can't do it, you know? So there's that. I So so recently she had a little squat mishap on the test day uh, and I feel like she just completely <laughs> psyched herself out I on a, a squat. And she just went way slower on the eccentric than she <laughs> was doing on the warm up. Yeah. And she's totally nerfed herself. And that's just part of the process though. Any lifter who says their mentality doesn't get in the way is just so full of it. I've never seen anyone not have mental problems. Some people are too confident. Other people are not confident enough. Shout out also to the uh, person who asked us, Sarita Mini, not to get confused with this Mini right here. <laughs> uh, she was someone who actually gave me the idea for talking about mentality with lifting today. But everyone has their different vices. So for you, you went from being an underthinker kind of overdoer to an overthinker underdoer. Is that kind of how you yeah, describe it? Yeah, sadly, yeah. Okay. So I need to find that middle ground and know when to overthink things and when to just go for it. Yes. That's why I like my headphones so much because I don't I think as much and I'm not like thinking about who's watching me or like what I look like or yeah. what my lifts are feeling like. I just like do it. So kind of that helps me. Music. Yeah. I think for me, um, I'm kind of, I've gone through the phases too. I think everyone yeah. has. I think that's what experiences do to you. Yeah. Yeah. You start shifting through the phases. At one point, I didn't think at all. Like I, I'm someone who's naturally really aggressive, really like confident, really like over the top. And so when I got into lifting, like more was better, harder was better. Like there was. Oh yeah, that's and, pretty much every. Well, not every, but a lot of beginner lifters, yeah. Yeah, sometimes. But I, well, I think a lot of people, it's one or the other extreme, right? It's a lot of underdoers, yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of like too nervous. Or like me, I was, I feel like I was really extreme though. I yeah. mean, if you look at some of my old squat videos, like my first 600 pound squat even, which is a while ago, but numbers wise, not that far off from where I am now. What I went blazing into that 600 pound <laughs> squat. And my gains up to that point were just me doing rep maxes all the time and just doing stupid stuff that I wouldn't program for athletes. Well, there was, was no prime podcast at the time. There That's wasn't. Why. There, I wasn't <laughs> holding myself accountable. And so I, I got injured after that and it, it made me that overthinker for a while where right. every little feeling in my body was something wrong. Every yeah. little overshoot was the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Every little mm -hmm. sensation mattered so much and that fucked me so bad too. Mm -hmm. So I went from one extreme to the other now I like to think I'm pretty good. I think this training cycle has been one of my best because of my mindset. I've been really poised and I think that helps me so much compared to like being on other ends of the extreme. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think my biggest hurdle though currently, my mental hurdle, if I had to choose one, is probably that I'm still, I have a hard time being honest with myself in the training moment. I've conquered it a little bit, but I would say like overshooting and things like that. Hmm. That that's what I've really conquered this cycle, but that's still probably something I'm gonna have to work on a long long term. I tend to be an overshooter and someone really concerned with acute performance. And it's not even like like I'm the opposite. I'll feel sensation now and I'm just like it's in your head. Yeah. Five cycles so pain. <laughs> your arm's like hanging it. off. Yeah, it's like something's like it's split, like a bone just sticking out of my body. It's into, just in your head. Get a car crash in the yard. Yeah, that's fine. I'll walk it off. <laughs> Throw a little more dirt on it. So I'm still kind of working on the mentality. I do think I'm a little bit closer towards the middle now. I've worked on some things pretty well, but if anything, there's one mental hurdle I deal with overshooting and overconfidence a little bit well that's good for you because if anyone knows brendan he's a very extreme person no, so not. he's either like on one end of this spectrum or the other and yeah. so middle balance is not his natural Forte. state yeah, so <laughs> yeah it's not that's, it's something you have to work on i think it's a lot of people it's right? definitely not my natural state. <laughs> yeah i feel like i found my middle ground um I don't know how to explain like when I first came to you because I feel like I do. I, I remember just you screaming a lot and throwing yeah. your belt. Yeah. Um, well, I, I like you call your belt, Lorraine. <laughs> yeah, well, well, she, well the, the the buckle belt. broke, so now I have a new belt. I don't know. It, what it was either that yet. or you were just like super or like Lorraine. like because I was so drained from hyping up all the fucking time. I was like, ah, <laughs> oh, fuck this. Do you not um, remember that one training cycle where you you like forced out a PR in your squat and you just looked miserable after? And I was just like, this is not. Yeah, like, that's when like, I was like, cool. all right, I need to stop doing that. Yeah. Um, because it was like when he would overthink everything too, where he'd be like, 
like I don't know. He would just get under the. It was like at first like, when I like before starting uh, coaching with you, like I wouldn't really think too much, but I was I would still get like nervous. But then I just hype up for it and forget mm. about it. Yeah. So it'd be like that, and then it got to a point where I was like, okay, everything hurts. I can't do that. Um, so then I started overthinking everything and then yeah, you guys after, are kind of similar. and then, yeah, after testing and then hitting 600 again in the gym, I was like, okay, I feel like shit and I still have to max out on deads and bench <laughs> and that didn't go well. Um, so it was after that cycle, I think is when I like took multiple steps back in terms of mentality and I was like, okay, I need to stop like forcing it out so often. And so let's talk deeper about that. What did you use from a mental standpoint to feel those? Cause I think me and you were the same where I used to use a lot of angry things to feel me. Yeah. And now my lifting feels very progressive. I feel very like, it's almost like me and the barbell doing it together. Yeah. Rather yeah, than yeah. the barbell versus yeah. me. Yeah. I know. Yeah, same. Sometimes I'm like, okay, the barbell's my bitch today. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's, it's definitely more, Progressive. I just watched too much George Lehman. I don't know if anybody remembers oh, no, him. No. That guy's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's insane. Yeah, he dealt with like eight hundred pounds for reps, and then he would. Like, he was like cry. talking about how he like. Cry? Yeah, because yeah, like, he would just get so emotional, yeah. he would just lose it. Wow, I need some of that. I've I've had that. My last meet, I started getting all weird and shit. Yeah, like, I like, My final deadlift attempt, and then I missed it. <laughs> and I think a lot of that was mentality. We'll talk yeah. about that later. It's but it's like the risk of reward because if you get the lift, it's like fuck yeah. But then like. If you it, it don't, so much yeah, to though, and it just it's distracting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think holding. I've been hammering this with my clients. I keep telling them that like mindset will dictate your execution, and your execution will dictate your performance. Yes. So it's like, what are what is the goal of the day? Yeah, yeah, sure. You have a single at RP eight or some shit. Does that mean annihilate yourself, or does that mean like just like push a heavy single? Yeah. Like just keep that in mind. So always remembering like like me personally, I think understanding like what the training is meant for has made me more responsible because now I know what to do. Yeah. And also just being able to like practice my technique and hone that and always kind of have that as like something to rely on, not to like be overly cautious or overthink about like, is my technique going to fuck up today or whatever. It's like, no, it's going to be there. It's fine. Yes. And if you understand the goal of the day, you understand what you're trying to achieve Mm -hmm. and therefore you understand how to go about achieving that. As where if you just always see RPA on paper, you may not understand like, Hey, this is an RPA, but don't, don't summon like fucking hype of the gods yeah, to get yeah. this done. I don't think people realize that RPA can be two completely different numbers on the same day with the same lifter. Yeah. Th- this is something that no one talks about with RP scale. We've mentioned it kind of previously before, but I am not kidding when I say tomorrow I have a single at RP eight on the program and I guarantee fucking to you, I can make 630, maybe even 40 pounds move at an eight. Right. But I would summon like the amount of hype that I need yeah. to do that. Be- <laughs> the, yeah. The old oh, man. So could do that. Sure. Yeah. Last training cycle, there was nothing in me that made sense for a 640 pound squat. Yeah. In fact, I failed it one day trying it. I was there. Then I tried it again. I was there too. How much hype oh, did I call man. for that? I'm surprised they didn't call the cop. My dad came outside and was just staring at me like, what the fuck is the amount of hype I used to get that squat set done? So it's, it's just like crazy what, what your mentality can do actually literally from an acute standpoint of performance. Yeah. You're, you're like, RP8 is so different. So tomorrow, I'm aiming for about 6'11", mm-hmm. very calm. I mean, I'm gonna hype up a little bit to kind of simulate like what I'm gonna be doing here in my test day coming up soon, but I am doing it in a way where I'm just kind of focused on execution. Right. Right. And I'm saving that hype for the coming week. Right. I don't want anything in me to use that early and just fatigue the living shit out of myself. But I assure you, in that set, if I did it the way I'm planning to tomorrow, that 611 ish is going to probably be a single RP8. Or I can move like 630, 640, and I mm-hmm. promise you, I could bang out another two reps in that set. But man, would they be grinders and it would be using so much adrenaline in me. And I've done things like that. So RP8 is, is literally dependent kind of on your mentality and your yeah. adrenaline you're it's using. For sure. For and sure. I don't think everyone has that ability. I think some people can kind of call on that. I was just going to say, like I I, mine's pretty consistent because I mm. don't know how to, I don't know how to hype. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you don't know how to hype. You get hype, but like, I just That's don't like, know if you're as psycho as me and Andrew. Like, like certain people just kind of have that ability to, Tune yeah. in somewhere dark. Yeah. And maybe I shouldn't even say dark. It's just like or just like channel this aggression. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, I just throw me on the freeway. I can be aggressive. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's, that's actually really true. Oh. That's the key. Next test day, I'm gonna have you driving <laughs> no. traffic 
before we get no, there. No, but that's why I listen to that devil music because it's like, oh god, that's what gets me angry. <laughs> oh my god, she really does listen to some devil sounding shit. I just, I'm old school man. A little EDM, a little little rap is fine for me. This girl wants like. I'm pretty sure if there is a hell and Satan's there waiting for someone to show up, that music's playing <laughs> on the way to your walk of the, to those gates, those fiery gates. That shit's kind of scary. Yeah, I don't but, like your music. Wait, so um, yeah. as far as this this topic, mentality towards training, was yes. that anything specific or just general? I think we can get into specifics here. Was she asking something specific? So she gets nervous about her PR. So Sarita oh, Mini okay. on my YouTube channel. I don't know if her name's Sarita or if that's a nickname, Sarita Mini or what, but okay. she was asking basically that she has been getting so much progress from the coach she's working with that she is nervous to do these PRs, even though they're like RP8s and they're moving well yeah. from week to week. But she's entering a zone where she's never touched these weights before. That's actually happened to me where I get nervous. And when I, when I went from like a 450 to 550 squat, it was literally in like a five month time period. And that happens a lot where you like don't yeah. make any gains for like a year. And then you have like a six month period where you just make all those gains you should have made in that year in like half the time. <laughs> and you're just like, oh shit, when you show up to the gym, and you'll do sets where they feel kind of mentally tough and then you look on camera and you're just like, Jesus, like this is so easy. Mm. And a lot of that I think is because we're just so nervous. So do you guys ever get nervous for PR still? hundred percent. Even weights that I've done before, I still get nervous when I hit mm. certain weights. I don't know if that's normal, but I think, uh, I think, oh yeah, like no, since you are making like consistent progress and hitting these numbers, you should just trust yourself. And I think that's where technique comes into play and just consistency, consistency. because then you don't have to worry about it. Is my back going to give out or my knees going to cave in or anything like that? You can just trust what's going to happen. I think that's another thing that happened with my last meet prep that went so well is like we created so much consistency. Yes, on the bar. Every was rep was like very, you know, controlled. And so like I trusted the execution of the lift. And Let's that's, explain that deeper though. Yeah. I don't think people, so, so what, when we say consistency, we, we mean literal steps on execution on the barbell. Right? Yeah. So like, what were your steps with the, the barbell as far as like the deadlift goes, that last meet prep? What were the first things you start going I made, down? In the I made my uh, setup very, very consistent, meaning like I had a checklist. So I would stand on the bar, you know, like set up my feet, squeeze everything. So I would tension my quads and then I would just tension everything from the bottom up. And then, so feet, quads into the glutes, then set the hips, then I would brace and I would you know, set my arms, my back, and it was just very consistent from set to set and rep to rep. So there was no um, alteration, you know, it wasn't like the last set moved really fast and then all of a sudden I did something weird and then it was like really hard. So yeah, you're controlling was, every little variable. It was very yeah. controlled and I could pretty much predict how it was gonna move. And I think like, like even things down to the how you pull slack. People say, oh yeah, now I pull slack and then I lift the lift up, blah, blah, blah. You can change how you pull slack. You can get a lot of slack, you can get a little slack, you can pull the slack up and then let go of it mid-lift. Like you gotta execute that the same. And that's one of the biggest things that I would recommend to you at home is if you are nervous hitting PRs, build an extreme amount of repeatability mm -hmm. and consistency yeah. down to the fucking smallest detail. How you, which foot you put first, which, everything like a little like you know kind of seance or like something you're setting up that you're just executing in this way and if you don't do it it's not going to go the right way it, that that in some terms can kind of go wrong if you like throw something off but remember you have a minute on the platform a full minute and you should be ready ahead of time if you executed your meat day preparations correctly and so like sometimes i grip the barbell and kind of do something a little off like nope that's not yeah. my setup here we go again boom yeah. set it set it yeah. brace ribs all the shit i'm thinking about and you go down this little mental checklist that makes such a big huge weight off your shoulders it takes it off because now you can just examine the footage examine your training and know okay even though this is scary i know i can do this if i do that execution yeah. the right way like i'll feel nervous but the second i get under the bar i'm like no it's gone yep you know it's going yeah yeah there's so many people too where they're like they get overly confident and then they like all of a sudden do something randomly different for their or next they're like they're set. like too aloof they're like yeah. too yeah. remember like um you had someone at a meet where they just randomly changed their stance. Do you remember that on their deadlift? I think it was Callan or Sean or someone. I don't know, but anyways. Oh, I remember recently. It, Is that it, why it he ended up third? being really hard. No, it was a while ago. Well, Callan did actually have a setup this problem this time, but I think it was mostly like a grip issue and mm. stuff. 
Um, I can't remember who that was, but I've definitely had athletes I know do that over the years. Yeah. And I've definitely made that mistake. But yeah. I think when that happens, it's actually, again, a couple things are one, they probably don't have as much repeatability down as they think. Yeah. So again, I'll ask people, oh, do you have a squat set up? Uh, yeah, okay, explain it to me. They can't, dude, I can tell you right pinky on the ring first, yeah. left pinky on the ring, pack right shoulder, pack left shoulder, under the bar in the middle, set this, ribs down, push up on the bar to push the slack out, back down, big breath in, then unrack, right foot back, left foot back. I can tell you to Take the notes. fucking T. I think people yeah, used to make fun of your deadlift setup because it would be like oh, yeah. so extreme. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing like a Macarena one. Like, Already. Yeah, uh, no, I would do it. <laughs> Everyone would always make fun of it. I, even my barber who doesn't lift, he's like, Yeah, man, I saw your lifting, but he's like, What is this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what are you, well, like, what are you doing? Yeah, lucky was like, What are you doing? Oh my god, <laughs> dude. It, but the reason I'm doing that, so I'm thinking long arms there, right? Yeah, and and can I just achieve that by bending down and doing that down there? Sure, but when I have something that forces me to do that, I'm getting that sensation feedback, yeah. Long arms and protraction. That proprioception, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. like creating awareness. So now, checked off the list. I feel myself doing it. Yeah. Could I set my shoulders at the same time in the squat? Sure, but it's kind of like check one, check two, right? <laughs> so it, it seems funny, but it's that's there needs to be that repeatability. Oh, yeah, yeah like you want to start looking like almost like robotic. Yeah. Yes. Doing it. yeah. Bryce Lewis preaches this all the time, and I, I, I know people... He's big on mentality. He is, and I love his post on mentality. I love a lot of the stuff he talks about because I think it's the things people push under the rug, but probably actually affect acute meat performance or acute like day performance bigger than some of the other factors that you mm -hmm. can control for. Like, honestly, if someone overshot by one RP every single day on a program, sure, there'd be detrimental effects, but I'll tell you what's going to be a bigger detrimental effect. They get on that platform, they go blank, they don't have a repeatable setup, and all of a sudden their form looks different, they're missing that lift. Yeah. As where the program execution would affect that day, but not to the point where they're missing a lift. You know what I mean? And so like these things, mentality hugely matters. If you can summon hype and you know how to do that in a responsible way where you can still focus, you know that that's a tool for you on meet day yeah. or on certain days where you want to use that. But you also know when to pull that back and things like that. There's there's all these tools with mentality that you have in your arsenal. With you, I know you're consistently the same as far as hype goes. So I'm not thinking about that when I'm planning out your meet attempts, right? I'm thinking, okay, consistent. What have we seen in the gym? I can base it off that. For me, I know I'm going to get that meet day boost. So I plan that into the attempts. And these are the mental things I don't think people talk about enough. What, what about you? How much how much do you think you get out of hype? A lot. Barbell? If you had a, do, do a lot. quick rough math, what's the percentage increase? For me, I think like probably 5%, right? So like on a 600 pound squat, that, that's 30 pounds. I think I could add 30, 40 pounds easy to my lift on a squat or deadlift by just hyping more. Yeah. What about for you? I feel like around that same range, yeah. maybe like five wow. to 10, because when I last maxed out, I hit 635. And I could have definitely gone up, but I oh, yeah. kind of wanted to save it for deads. You just didn't want to pass um, me, okay. <laughs> Mine was high bar. Oh my Whoa. god. <laughs> you can't even fucking low bar. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I definitely could have gone up, you, but I wanted really to save have. it. That was really easy. I feel like you even had more in the tank for deads, too, but I was just oh, like, that's I enough. So. I just wanted to hit seven for the first time. Um, so yeah, I definitely get a boost out of adrenaline, but I was like making sure I saved it for that day. Like leading up to it, I was, I was so say. fucking reserved. Um, well, I feel like you even save some on that day for the other lifts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like you didn't waste it all on squat, yeah. even though you know you could have expanded that. Yeah, out like I didn't feel dead by the time. So I did squat, deadlifts, and then bench because I hate doing bench. Um, and I was like surprised by like how easy bench was. Yes. Like I hit like a thirty pound PR out of nowhere, and I was just like, how the. I remember fuck? your reaction was like, ha ha, what the. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what the fuck is this shit? Because I, I like felt, I, I still felt fresh. I still felt like I had some yep. more left in the tank. And I was like, okay, like, hit. 30. And then you came over and supported me. Like that's my mental <laughs> energy. Yeah, I was like, I, I was like, fine. I was testing on the same day. Yeah, yeah, um, and I beat you. <laughs> Hang there. <huh>? Okay. <laughs> All right, what else on mentality? Uh, how mindset usually affects your training outcomes, everything? Oh yeah, so plateaus and progress, let's talk about that. So this is something everyone's gonna deal with and this is where they start screwing up. 
How many times have you program hopped or tried to change variables when you're in a plateau that could be easily explained by maybe being in desensitization phase, mm -hmm. right? Maybe being in a phase where you're purposely prioritizing the other two lifts instead of one of the lifts. Or maybe you just know like, hey, I'm feeling beat up. Like I need to take a step back, whatever it may be. Or maybe it just happens to be a plateau. you made tons of gains on your squat and your squat's just being stubborn right now. This is where I think people make some of the biggest mistakes is they, they enter plateaus and then they're like, shit, I need to be progressing right now. Mm -hmm. You That's not how it works. Do the math. I remember what my math was on my squat average monthly gain since I started. And obviously I think I'm oh, slightly above average, 2.9 pounds, I think, yeah, or something. Pounds. There's like 2.9 <laughs> pounds per month gain. Imagine telling a trainee, hey, this cycle, man, I got you. We're gonna average three pounds on your squat per month. Like, obviously it doesn't actually work out that way. Some months you gain a lot, some you gain nothing. And that's kind of the point here is that it's a modest creep. Yeah. And people think every training cycle has to be And your progress, progress is not always like outwardly reflective of where you're at. Not at all. I mean, there's so many variables that could be affecting you yeah. from a performance standpoint. And so people start making these mistakes. What, what are some of your guys' biggest mistakes that you see others making or you've made yourself as far as um, you know, hitting a plateau or being really progressive, maybe you're PRing like crazy and then you start doing things wrong. What are the big mistakes that come to mind for you guys? I think once I started PRing like crazy under you and then we went through a block where we just kind of like held it back. Yeah. I think in my head, like I still wanted to push it, yeah. but that ended up shooting me in the foot because like, okay, now I'm fatigued all the time mm -hmm. and I can't squat at all. Um, so I think that was my mistake, just not being aware of where we are in the training cycle and not properly executing that because my mindset was just not in the right place. Yeah, and even though we told you ahead of time, like, hey, we're, we're literally pulling back here mm -hmm. and stopping the cycle early because you made so yeah. many gains, yeah. I was afraid of you getting injured. Because when you start adding 50 pounds to your squat in a fucking cycle, mm -hmm. you, you start thinking, like, I don't want to destroy this kid's knees who's yeah. 19, he's a new trainee under me. like. As much as it sucks to stop, like let's play the long game here a right, little bit. Yeah. What is that extra ten or twenty pounds we could add here if it destroys you? Yeah, and it's right? like I knew that was a good thing to do. I just didn't know how to go about actually executing yeah. that. Yeah, right? you know it's a good thing. You just don't want to do it. Yeah, yeah. Like so, um, I've programmed singles before and it was going really well. And then I tried to extend that and it's just like it's really stale like it doesn't go anywhere and it's like why did we just waste that extra month trying to push out the extra like what one to two pounds okay so you're you know saying I mean? in like a peaking phase. okay yeah, 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 yeah where you try to like maximize the gains where it's just like why so instead of stopping the training cycle 12 weeks getting the pr you're good with you think oh let me push volume a little bit longer i'll keep heavy yeah. singles in on my primary day try to extend out the stimulus get an extra 10 pounds of squat and then the whole thing yeah up. yeah so that or like if it's just plateauing like I see people just all of a sudden just going to a new coach or trying yeah. a new program trying a new program like... I wrote on here Instagram program lurking that's what I call when the people <laughs> oh. are like in a little plateau and they're like the, the athlete will come to me hey man can we add SSB squats even though I've never done those because they see everyone else doing they it they see everyone else doing SSB squats yeah. or, or it'll be a trainee that I just know that like I'm not even coaching and like all of a sudden they're like hey week three on you know program X Y and Z and I'm doing this and then like two weeks later they're like oh implementing this new thing into my mm -hmm. training I'm like didn't you just start a program like what yeah. are you doing and so they start program hopping based on what they're seeing and there's this perceived mental benefit that's not really there where they see X, Y, and Z lifter doing such and such and they think, oh, they're being successful. Oh, yeah. and this lifter over here is also doing it. Let me implement it because yeah. that's the key. Even though you're not that lifter. Exactly. Yeah. And you're not in that state and yeah. there's no magical exercises and or program out there. I mean, maybe that lifter's not even getting anything out of that too. Like, exactly. It could just <laughs> why be, would you copy that? It could just be that they're just squatting really well and those SSB squats they threw in are not actually helping their squat. It just happens to be in the program and it's something else. How do you know that's the variable leading to the lifter's success? This is where the biggest mind folks have as a coach is, how do I know what is making the lifter successful? Yeah. There's is so it, many things. Is it their mentality lately? Is it the program they're on? Is it this exercise? Is it that exercise? How do we know, you know what's making them successful? Yeah. There, there's so much there. Because it's a culmination of like all those things. It's yeah. hard to pinpoint which ones Or maybe just which. some of those things. Yeah. Right? Which ones are the big factors? Which ones are kind of helping, but just in a small sense? These are things you need to start thinking about. And 
What I can tell you is that having clear data is the most important thing mm -hmm. and being mentally free of just trying to program hop or trying to fix things that can't be fixed or whatever it is. I, I guarantee you, you're going to get more out of running the training cycle that doesn't make progress because you, you'll learn something from that after right. and learn what didn't work and what did work compared to the lifter who just changes a thousand things, even if they end up squeaking out a PR at the end somehow. Mm -hmm. One, you know it's going to be a measly PR because they just changed a thousand variables. But two, even if they PR, now they learn nothing because they just threw in so many wrenches into that system. Right. And they don't know what changed what right. and what the outcome was. I think you were guilty of doing that. Definitely. Like not too long ago. I think that's what's made a huge difference in this most current program is like you actually trusted it and executed it like the right way and I think that the, the big approached thing, it the right way yeah I did and I think the big thing there too is that um, it, at some point you do have to be a little bit more on the fly as an athlete gets really advanced mm -hmm. you can't always stick to programs sometimes and things sometimes you do wrong. need to question things like that's yes. warranted as well keeping an open mind yeah but you need to know when and how to do that and so I think the biggest mental hurdle there is am I making an objectively smart intelligent informed decision or am I doing this based off emotions because Emotion. I saw yeah. something on Instagram <laughs> yeah. or I'm really angsty to PR or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Again, writing out those, so, so one of my lifters, Leon, just texted me, he's like, he's like, dude, you added so much to your bench lately on, on your uh, bench in the last year and like blah, blah, blah and like he just sees the progress and he's like, dude, we got to get that going for my bench. He's squatting deadlift and <laughs> climbing like crazy, yeah. right? His bench has just been on like a plateau but I was like, that's what you saw but you didn't see the two years before that where I literally added five pounds to my bench in a two-year time frame. Yeah. Five pounds in two years. The only reason I was able to make these gains is I kind of rode out that plateau and I knew it was going to shoot up. I knew it wasn't my program. It was just my bench on mm -hmm. pause. One, one year it was kind of like an injury. The next year it was just because it was just one of those situations where I couldn't gain. I wasn't in a caloric surplus for the mm -hmm. most of the year and I just knew that was part of the process. And so there, there's variables there that I was comfortable just taking that plateau, right? And and th these are things you need to understand the the current state of what you're trying to get after, right? What are the goals? Are we trying to progress right now? And we need to understand what these plateaus are coming from and not make uninformed decisions around them. Mm -hmm. um, how do you guys control your, your emotions currently? I think this is huge. I'm always emotionally controlled, so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Me and you are both. No, no, no. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, there's definitely been times where my whole day has gone to shit just because my lift didn't go a certain way. Um, Let, let's actually. So what? You know what? One tactic I've learned with you too, because coaching a significant other's hard. I'm sorry. Is, um, I I learned to to talk after the session. So if we talk in this session. <laughs> That shit don't work, bro. <laughs> that don't work at all. I might end up with a black eye. But if we talk after the session, it goes way smoother because you're a little bit more calm down, you're removed from the situation, and then we can discuss what variables are working and what are not. And then we have an actual conversation because I'm not always right. No, I know. There's Sometimes no way the coach is always you just right. got to let the person feel what they need to feel and then um, let them be alone with their thoughts for a little bit and situate everything out and then talk about it. Because that moment of introspection is not there when the emotions are there. So you just need some time, depending on the lifter, of course. Um, but for me, I definitely just need to feel what I need to feel, be angry for a little bit, and I do need to do better about controlling that for sure. Um, and again, having certain expectations, executing certain things the right way, and all that stuff will come into play. But um, for me, I, I'm, I don't get overly emotional, I don't think. Um, I'm pretty controlled for the most part. Like I don't get super hyped where it fucks me up or I don't get like, I don't know, just st stupid. So I think yeah. I'm okay on that front, but, um, just, yeah. Like if I don't have a certain lift go a certain way, I definitely take it the wrong way and I take it too personal almost. And then and you then, start reacting the wrong way. And then, with yeah. Like program design and like, Hey, we need to change. I start blaming that. you or like, yeah. yeah, blaming all these other things that it's just, yeah. What it's about you? How do you control your emotions? What are what are some of the main things that come to mind that you've changed recently to have better success, especially in either testing day scenarios, meets, or just you know really like uh, like end results of a program? I literally have no expectations. <laughs> like That's when I one. when I well, I have goals and I know like what numbers I should be hitting. Yeah. Um. So I'm prioritizing that, but I'm not trying to like. 
I'm not trying to go there to like push those numbers, if that makes sense. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to force those numbers out. So it's like I enter like my training session with expectations, but at the same time, I'm not married to it. Yeah. Like I'm not overly attached to it. I'm just like, okay, that's what I got to hit. But if it's not there, that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. I think when not this training cycle, but the one before, after I peaked, um, when we dropped squat frequency to twice a week, I'd like heavy doubles and like singles or some shit again mm -hmm. um and you're like hey if we don't pr that's fine but if it's there you know take it yeah so i was i just had that in mind every single time i like had singles for yeah. my saturday sessions and i was like okay squat feels good today so i'm gonna push it squat doesn't feel great today oh well like move on to the next thing move that on was a desensitization phase kind of yeah with the, yeah and i think that's the the right mindset is zero expectations i know for me personally that's one of the biggest things i've actually changed recently uh, not being married to those. The other day I hit like a 562 squat like a little while back for like four mm. and I, it flew. And so I was thinking hopefully 584 to 595 for a triple around mm. the same RP and the, the block coming that had the triples coming up. And what ended up happening is is the day I was supposed to do some triples, I was hoping for that goal, 573 was pretty hard. Yeah. And I just capped it there. I was like, you know what? This is the weight. I'm using yeah. this. Instead of doing it as a warm-up single, did it as the triple. And I just stuck with that. And even though that was a PR and that was actually a weight I'd had some problems with in the past, I, I res reserved myself. And then sure enough, the week after that, 595 for a really easy double. Yeah. And so oh, I misloaded. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> it's the yeah. fucking squat bar. I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, we both misloaded that one. Um, but the whole the whole point there though is that pulling back just a little bit mm. on that day, removing that expectation, dealing with something a little bit lighter, led to a better future success. Yeah, I, and I also didn't want to roll into my next string and cycle feeling like shit. Yes, and that's and that's key. It's like you understood why. So just to recap here real quick. So on on your end, we're saying remove ourselves from the situation and, and examine the variables after that may have led to this poor success or this this failure or whatever it may be, this bad day in the gym. I think that's huge. If you're gonna examine your training variables after a rough day, okay, why has progress not been going so much or so well lately? Mm -hmm. Do it at home after you're removed from the session. Don't do it in the gym. Don't, and actually do it. Like literally look at your program, look at your numbers over the last couple blocks. Look at where it was going up, where it was going down. Examine the changes, be very objective yeah. about it. Don't go off of this. Yeah, this is no good decisions are ever shit. made when you're in a, an emotional state. No, never. For never. anything. <laughs> nah, and so you definitely gotta remove yourself from the situation. On your end, zero expectations, control your emotions by, by being almost like Buddhist, like just like mm -hmm. live in the moment and don't be afraid of like changing to the variables that come to yeah. play. I think for me, um, one of the biggest things that helped me control my emotions is it, it's funny because I'm one of the most competitive people I know and that shoots me in the foot. I hate losing shit like uh, charades at like a Christmas party with the family. I hate losing anything. I hate losing at golf. I hate like, even when I'm playing against myself, like <laughs> no matter what it is, I'm so competitive. And removing that piece of my lifting and being able to explain to myself why I can't compare myself to others with lifting, it mm -hmm. sounds kind of like soy boy and just kind of whack you know what i mean like it sounds kind of like like oh but my don't god don't you think that having like that emotional edge can be beneficial yes if you're in the right place to use that but i am overly competitive to the point where i will force out performance with that adrenaline i was talking about so in tomorrow right like i could go in there if this was brendan from a year ago and move that 630 at RPA and be like, look, motherfuckers, what I just did, right? Yeah. <laughs> then it shoots me in the foot at the meat, though, right? Instead, I'm like, who cares what I hit tomorrow? Who cares what X, Y, and Z over there is doing? Let me just hit what I know is a good yeah. RPA for me and then go into the meat and put up the best meat I can. Yeah. Same thing. Like, objectively, meat. too, like you're, you're training for the meat, not training for a training day in the gym. Exactly. And then, so, same thing is like, if you're going into a meat and your meat selection attempt numbers are something like, like really on the, the edge of your seat because mm -hmm. like you want to beat that this lifter at nationals or you want to just way destroy your old total yeah. instead of choosing some smart safe PRs that you know are there under the worst circumstances and being prepared for everything you choose some numbers that like you maybe you could get if everything goes perfect yeah you have all the time on that platform that you you can get and the judges are being really lenient that is such a difference in the outcome that's going to happen there because of you know your uh, competitiveness, whether it be with yourself or someone else. 
that can really mislead you. And and this stuff, same thing in training. You're mm-hmm. watching Joe Shimo on Instagram PR yeah. with with you know a five rep max with your one RM, and so you're like, I need to catch this guy. You start trying to force those loads out. I've done this a thousand times. It'll work for like three, four weeks. You'll make some gains, and then you're just dealing with pain. Yeah. You're dealing with all these other repercussions, and then it sets you back in the long run. Mm-hmm. I think these things are so invaluable to a lifter to start thinking about. No one talks about it, and this is the shit. We're human. They're, why do we have the saying, we're only human? Because we know we're not analytical robots. We're not the people who can just intake information yeah. and perfectly dissect and execute what we need to do. We're human. We have that emotional bias and filter that we take everything through. Unless you're Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. He's a reptile. Dude, he's fucking weird. Yeah. Oh when he talks, God. he just looks like a robot. And then that all that sunscreen on his face. Stop. What was that about, yeah. bro? And then like the clothes. I don't trust how he drinks water. I don't know. <laughs> Dude's more successful than us, so maybe we're doing something wrong. Maybe we got to be weird like him. I show up to the next like prime gas like with just sunscreen. like sunscreen all over my face. Um, uh, well, I also think um, learning how to. Well, this is for me. Learning how to let it go. So like. Um, say your lift doesn't go well don't let that affect the rest of your session let alone the rest of your day so like i think a lot of us we get too emotionally attached to what we're doing so like powerlifting, for instance so it's like it affects our whole life if it doesn't go well and then Uh we see this whole mental decline because we're so emotionally attached to these arbitrary numbers because we're comparing ourselves and we have all these expectations so just like separating yourself from the lift like those are two separate entities so like even if your lift doesn't go well, you still have all these other things that you can still accomplish and learning how to separate that I think is really important. You know what's a good point here is how archaic and lost in the confusion of your own lack of control do you start to feel after you start making poor judgment decisions and changing variables? So what I mean by this, week one you overshoot your squats, you, you do p- poorly, you, like something goes wrong, and then you react to that, change this variable, you change your mm-hmm. mindset, you change your, you just your variables, and then next week kind of goes wrong, and then so you shift more mm-hmm. stuff around. Next thing you know, you're not even on the same program, or you're yeah. not in the same mentality or mindset. You're just, you, you start It's like you've to fallen feel, down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You yeah. start to feel lost in the confusion of all of it, and then not only do you not know what's working, what's not, you're, you're changing all these things and you're, con- you're basically not on a program now because you're changing all these variables. You're not in the same repeatability with your setups and your execution. You're not in that same um, kind of stress-free environment that really produces gains. I can't tell you how much mental stress will affect your strength and muscle gain results. Mm-hmm. Like it's so big. And so like these things, you can start to get lost on that rabbit hole if you don't control those. I'll tell you what, man, the lifters who respond the best under me, Daniel's a good example. I just put him in one of my videos. That kid is so emotion free with his lifting and it makes him like, he knows how to hype. I'm not talking yeah. about hype, but like he's doesn't react negatively to bad days or where something goes wrong mid set. And he always does the responsible thing. And I mean, when in life is that ever the, the wrong answer? When is doing the <laughs> responsible thing, the right emotional free thing ever the wrong answer? And so, he gets a ton of results. I'll tell you what, the lifters who struggle the most under me are the guys like, Coach, I just need to feel that weight today. Yeah. Hey, Coach, I, I just really need to do this this way. Like a little too much ego is attached to like their lifting. Yeah. Yeah. Or the opposite of what was happening where maybe like instead of ego getting in the way, they're just fucking like so afraid of weights, right? Yeah. The, the girl's asking about this in the comment section. It, you know, she was saying how, how certain weights scare her that can affect your execution too. Like mm-hmm. if you start pulling back too much instead of actually, you know, showing up for those PRs and getting through it and stuff and, and making it happen. And then you start questioning yourself some more. Next time that PR comes up, it gets even worse any yeah. time after that. And so there, there's definitely a rabbit hole with this stuff. And I think checking the, the mental variables can be huge. I think if you're too nervous, I almost feel like you kind of have to take that leap of faith and just really trust yourself when yeah. it comes to whatever number it is on the bar or if you're afraid of doing heavy singles or some shit. Yeah. Um, I really think like it's not fucking easy to do, but that's just something you kind of have to. You kind of have to force it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I wish there was some way to, to explain or like take my mindset. The one thing I've always done well is worked under pressure well. Mm -hmm. And not everyone can do this. And, and that's got to be hard to not have this ability. When I'm in front of an audience with uh, like a crowd, like for a meet or something, mm -hmm. or even just this here, like recording. Oh my God, you're drastically different. Not different in the sense where you're a different person, but like you like... You get amplified by it. I definitely do. I get positive results, I think, from being on the spot. Mm. And most people have the opposite effect, or I think yeah. a lot of people, where when they're put in the limelight or put under even just a pressure situation for themselves where they're the only person viewing it, but they yeah. know they're under pressure, they start to crack. And, and I wish I could tell people to just take that leap and you keep taking it, even yeah. if you fail it's a like couple if times. If you're feeling anxious, almost use that to your advantage yeah. and like conquer your inner bitch. Because that's how I feel at like meet days. I fucking love the crowd. Maybe we should just fuck. What was I gonna say? Like, <laughs> like, just do it. Like, if it's three hundred pounds on your back, in my case, three hundred pounds on your back. It's like who cares? Even if you fail, like so. No, totally. Like, and that's, you know what what I mean? th like, that's what I'm saying is yeah. take that leap of faith. Yeah. D even if you fail, keep taking it because eventually you'll make it. Right. And, and then you'll, you'll believe it. Stop in putting more. so much like emphasis on this one thing. Yeah. Right? Like honestly, this sounds really crazy, but what's the worst thing? I've literally had muscles tear on me mid-set. I've, I've failed sets mid-set. I'm okay. I'm still yeah. lifting. Like, not okay, but don't do this. Bad. But don't do that. <laughs> don't intentionally well, tear your dude, muscles mid-set. <laughs> Oh, it's all in your head. <laughs> I'm, like, this is I'm like limping off. This isn't real. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> like two people are going to understand that yeah. reference. Anyway, uh, no, no, no. So seriously though, nothing can really go wrong there. Even when things do go wrong, like shit happens. Like I tore my lat one time deadlifting. Mid rep, I just yanked that fucker up and I just... It felt like saran wrap and I heard an audible pop and I was like, that's not normal. Mm -hmm. Luckily, it didn't tear off the attachment side. I didn't need surgery, but swelling, bruising, all that came. And and what it, it's 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 okay. I'm okay. Yeah. I'm deadlifting over yeah. 700 pounds now. I think that was like a mid 500 pound pole or something at the time. And it's it's you're always going to be okay after. So take the leap of faith and just just make it happen and start to trust yourself. Trust yourself, yeah, for yeah. sure. Put yourself on the spot. Um, I think that's pretty much everything for today. We don't have uh, any of the updates that we need to talk about. Is there anything else you guys want to cover before we get out of here? No. No, I feel I'm like okay. we pretty much cool. talked about everything. Let's do it. So yeah. questions of the day for you guys at home. How much current volume do you guys train with per body part or per lift in sets per week? I want to know because it was kind of interesting in that study hearing how much variance there were with people that had five years training experience, which is kind of run-of-the-mill lifter. And some were doing like 44 sets per week on their quads. Others were doing like half of that. Some people even less. I want to know how much you guys are doing because that stuff kind of interests me on how what people kind of consider normal volume. Mm -hmm. And then I also want to hear about what your biggest mental hurdle is that you face and how you plan to overcome it. Leave a comment down below. Give the video a thumbs up. Do all that stuff. Say goodbye to the prime sign. We will see you guys in the next video.